contemporary Central Asia and the Caucasus, uh, who have organized today's event to mark the publication of a special issue of the journal Central Asian Survey. And the special issue is entitled The Afghan Conundrum, Intervention, State Building, uh, and Resistance. And we've got three distinguished speakers uh, who I'm going to introduce shortly. Before I do so, however, I've been told to bring your attention to two things. Firstly, uh, that this is an event that has a reception following it. Uh, for that reason, it's quite important that we try and finish by 6.30 so that we have enough time to socialize and vibe and uh, discuss the uh, day's proceedings with one another. And secondly, that <coughs> the uh, Central Asian Survey uh, is, uh, and the special issue of it is, is available for free on the internet until January. Uh, and each of the articles uh, <coughs> is, uh, I think you can download them. Uh, so take the opportunity to do so uh, before uh, January. Uh, <coughs> the special issue that we're uh, here to talk about is uh, timely in that it's published on the eve of 2014, which of course is the year uh, in which uh, there's going to be the drawdown of uh, foreign forces in Afghanistan. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, its uh, relevance and contribution uh, uh, really lies beyond that uh, date. Because one of the things about the special issue, from my mind anyway, that's uh, quite unique, is that it really gathers together a group of scholars and uh, 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 commentators who have been working on Afghanistan over a very long period of time together. And they use and draw on that experience to uh, generate some very interesting articles on a whole range of issues important to the country today, going from law and the legal system to the importance of militias to the role played by uh, aid <coughs> in, uh, in and international development and its political dynamics. Uh, and they also make comparisons historically between, for example, the situation facing the country and its political elites today and those that were having to be addressed by its leaders at the end of the 1980s. And so really, uh, unlike a, a sort of trend in some work on Afghanistan to relate the country to broader uh, models that are already uh, available in political science and other disciplines, one of the strong points of this uh, special issue uh, is <coughs> its grounding in the empirical realities of what's going on in Afghanistan, uh, uh, in Afghanistan today uh, and in the past. And for that reason, I think it's a a very notable contribution to uh, existing work in the field. So today we're going to have <coughs> brief uh, uh, presentations or uh, talks by three of the contributors to the journal. Uh, sitting to the far left is Jonathan Steele, who's an international affairs columnist and has reported regularly from Afghanistan uh, since 1981 when he first visited the country as foreign correspondent for The Guardian. Uh, he studied at Cambridge and Yale, and his most recent book is on Afghanistan. It's entitled Ghosts of Afghanistan, The Haunted Battleground. And this is an eyewitness analysis of 30 years of war and destruction. Uh, sitting to my left is Jonathan Goodhand, who's Professor of Development Studies at SOAS. Uh, he studied in universities of Birmingham and Manchester, has worked as a, both a development practitioner in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Sri Lanka, uh, but has also, <coughs> as an academic, analyzed the political economy of aid and conflict, NGOs and peace building, and post-conflict and reconstruction. Sitting in the middle, last, last but not least, is Aziz Hakimi, who is a SOAS PhD student in the, de in the Department of Development Studies. Uh, he's also a researcher at an institute in Bergen, Norway. And his, he's working on the important topic of US counterinsurgency and the role played by local militias in Afghanistan uh, today. And I think he's also worked for the a variety of organizations uh, within and beyond uh, Afghanistan. So I'm going to ask uh, Jonathan Goodhand to speak for exactly 12 minutes. Uh, <coughs> and then at the end, after we've heard all of the speakers, I think, we'll be able to have time for a discussion. So Jonathan Goodhand. Um, I'll try and be less than um, 12 minutes. Um, but I'd also very quickly like to thank, thank Professor Magnus Marsden, who uh, was at SAS, now is at the University of Sussex, but who stepped in to chair this session. He's also someone who has been uh, working on Afghanistan for many years, doing some 
extremely interesting uh, anthropological research. Okay, um, this, as, as Magnus says, this special issue, which is being co-edited by myself and, and Mark Sedra, we have tried to combine uh, people who are quite long in the tooth, like myself and, and Jonathan, if you don't mind me saying, who have been working on Afghanistan for many years prior to 2001, but also to younger, like Aziz, younger um, scholars and emerging scholars who have um, got a more recent engagement, but also a very deep engagement with the country. So we try to... Um, you know, include people who have a long experience and also some up-and-coming academics. And what I'm going to talk about briefly is about a where, how do we understand the intervention in Afghanistan in relation to some of these broader debates on liberal peace building and state building. Um, and what are the implications of some of the contributions to this uh, special issue for understanding transition and this 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 two post two. 2014 uh, scenario, and it's very you know it's a very important time to be looking at this and taking stock, and particularly with a great deal of uncertainty that we see at the moment around the uh, the signing or not the signing the the, the, the bilateral security agreement. Um, future trajectories are very much up in the air at the moment. So in the our introductory article, Mark Sedra and myself, we we first of all highlight the continuities between the wartime period in the post-2001, we don't see this as a water peace transition. Um, it's, um, really, it's a new, what we've seen post-2001 is a new phase of protracted um, and very volatile conflict. Um, and state building was an important part of the, uh, the rationale and, and the, the policies around international intervention. We didn't start off like that. We highlight how, in many ways, the, 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 the Bonn Agreement we can't understand this as some kind of transmission mechanism for the liberal peace. It involved messy compromi compromises, um, uh, was had illiberal and non-democratic elements, and in, what emerged was in many ways an elite pact, um, which um, didn't incorporate many of the key f constituencies in Afghan society and within the region more broadly. State building emerged actually S several years later, initially the, the, the kind of the, the impetus, the drive behind intervention was pursuit of the war on terror. And it was only embraced subsequently with the realization that um, state building was necessary for some kind of an exit strategy and also to somehow legitimize um, uh, the, the intervention. And there was quite a strong set of interests around, as Astri Cirque, one of the contributors, has, has highlighted, around. Um, building on and, and getting a heavier international footprint, um, particularly the military and aid actors argued, based on a notion of what Sirk talks about as critical mass, that there was a need to invest more resources financially, militarily, politically, um, in order to um, overcome sources of resistance um, and to invest in a more serious way in, 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 in Afghanistan. And as, as Cirque argues in one of the, the, the kind of overview articles, this produced all sorts of contradictions. Um, it produced um, contradictions around um, the idea of, a, of, of building up ownership of a strong state, and yet at the same time these resources were creating a very top-down, rentier state dependent on external resources. There was a contradiction between, on the one hand, the, the Afghan constitution, which is one of the most centralized in the world, and de facto political processes, which were highly decentralized and fractured. Um, there was a co contradiction between building up these formal structures, which were actually underpinned by um, informal political networks, something that Timur Sharan in his article highlights very nicely, um, and producing what might be called um, a rhizome state, there are the formal structures that are visible and the informal networks where real power lies um, with networks linked to jihadi groups um, in, that emerged in the wartime period. Now, over the, the length of the intervention, the international approach to state building changed quite radically. Um, Thomas Barfield, um, the American scholar, quite nicely summarizes this when he says that in 2002, the problem was seen by international actors as the absence of a strong 
legitimate um, state with the capacity to achieve a monopoly of violence and provide services within its territory. By 2008, this had changed to being seen as the problem was actually the existence of an overly centralized, corrupt, and illegitimate state. And the, 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 in, in kind of this shift um, manifest itself in a turn towards what Aziz is going to talk about in a minute, the, towards embracing the local, engaging with hybrid forms of governance, um, reinventing local traditions, whether it's militias, whether it's informal systems of justice, whether it's working with civil society groups and so on. Um, and this kind of shift, which kind of in many ways highlighted the contradictions within the kind of intervention at, at so many different levels. On the one hand, the, um, the, the promotion of uh, at least a rhetorically a local ownership, while at the same time creating parallel structures and systems that circumvented the state. The promotion of rule of law, while at the same time funding and supporting local militias. So in many ways, um, intervention and the so-called liberal peace building failed be as much because it's, it was undermined by its sponsors as because of resistance by domestic political elites. And in the kind of this, the bigger literature on international intervention around and criti critiques of liberal peace building, there's an assumption often that, that the international sphere is an area of coherence, of common interests around you know, liberal, liberal, liberal values and norms, and the local is the area where there's foot dragging, resistance, and uh, and, uh, and and conflict. And cl what what our, the the contributions to this this special issue show is that the actual the contradictions, the fractured nature of the external intervention, the different sets of interests, the different kind of strategies uh, that were involved. And what has been produced now, as we, we, we kind of look back and look to the future, um, is a very volatile and fractured political economy, what um, the political scientist Douglas North would call a limited access order, in which a political coalition has emerged, and that the interest the, the political coalition is glued around the interest in gaining rents, and the main sources of rent in Afghanistan's political economy now are international funding through the military, through aid, and also the drug economy. The problem is this, this limited access order is extremely volatile. Um, it doesn't incorporate all the key wielders of violence, so the Taliban are not part of this. And also, um, there's a constant hedging in, in between the state actors at the center and um, political military actors in the periphery who are kind of oscillating into and out of this limited access order. They're hedging, hedging all the time. And so no one is prepared to credi credibly commit to, to, the, um, to the rules of the game. So just standing back from the, the Afghan case before um, moving forward to transition, what kind of models um, are commentators looking at and drawing upon? On the one hand, there's this idea that Afghanistan is one of a whole series of experiments that we've seen in the post-Cold War world from Kosovo to East Timor to Cambodia, of liberal peace building, this idea of the simultaneous pursuit of conflict resolution, of market sovereignty, and, and, and democracy. Um, on the other hand, and we can see many, many kind of uh, examples of programs which seem to um, subscribe to this kind of template, including rule of law programs, good governance, and, and, and so on. On the other hand, uh, many commentators, including counterinsurgency experts and, and the military, actually s use the model of the kind of the late colonial wars, Algeria, um, Vietnam, um, where decidedly illiberal strategies and uh, interventions were, were, were deployed. And in a way, there's this, this kind of Janus-headed face to international intervention in Afghanistan. There's this kind of at least rhetorical and, and not just rhetorical commitment to, to democratic norms and, and liberal values. And on the other hand, there's highly liberal militarized forms of intervention. And it's oscillated between these two constantly. To finish off, um, there seem to be now three different narratives around understanding what's happening, what's happening in Afghanistan with important implications for the future. On the one hand, there's this narrative around the window of opportunity thesis, that there was a window of opportunity to get it right, 
um, but opportunities were lost in the early years of the intervention. And they, people of this kind of um, uh, this orientation argue that in 2000, up to 2004, 2005, there were some very positive changes going on in Afghanistan. There was a national NSP. There was um, all these tangible improvements in education, mortality rates, literacy, and so on. Um, but the model was too parsimonious. There wasn't enough resources um, invested. There was, wasn't enough um, uh, st coherence in the model. Um, and essentially, it wasn't liberal enough. Um, liberal peace builders became increasing illiberal as, as the insurgency increased. Um, so that's kind of one. And, and the implication of the drawdown is actually, of, of this kind of understanding, is actually a very bleak one, that reducing funding is actually going to in increase um, is, is the, the increased likelihood of a return to civil war um, you know, is, is the logic of this kind of argument. The second is that the second kind of narrative is that it was doomed from the outset. Um, that essentially, you know, the, 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 this is the narrative of path dependency. The situation was overdetermined, and the the international footprint was part of the problem. It produced these pathologies, these contradictions. And throwing more money at it, at it through the surge actually amplified rather than resolved the problems. Um, so in, in, in the event of the, the absence of an inclusive enough political settlement, um, the absence of consensus in the international and regional level, um, um, in exogenous state building is never going to work. And then the third, um, the third kind of narrative, and I have to, to finish off now, is that is the kind of the imperial thesis. That it was never about liberal peace building. It was always about geostrategic sets of interests, national interests. Um, so although th there was a, a kind of a justificatory narrative around liberal peace building, this was never the intention. To finish off, and this is kind of stepping out of the article, really, um, is this... this Although the different articles have, have different analysis and there's no kind of uh, um, universal kind of prognosis, um, they all show <coughs> that, and hint at a, a kind of a major paradox now that we're, we're faced with in Afghanistan, um, that exogenous state building has produced all these pathologies, um, has produced these contradictions, as being the sources of a whole range of problems. But now the sudden reduction of an international footprint um, could be also deeply damaging because the Afghan political economy is being adjusted by this intervention. That its um, political networks um, have um, are in many ways glued together by in, or in order to access rents from international aid and, and, and so on. So one of the implications of the, the, this the, the, um, the volume, I think, is that um, the need to think very carefully about a sudden <coughs> reduction in international presence um, because um, you know, society and the economy has been adjusted to its existence and some form of engagement may be necessary into the future. Um, otherwise, we may be faced with the Najibullah scenario that uh, Jonathan may be talking about. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, if you could pass the contraption along to Aziz. Thank you very much. Uh, my contribution to the special issue, which I think is timely because it is now, again, a surge of concerns about Afghanistan and its future. Jonathan summarized some of them. Uh, it is entitled Getting Savages to Fight Barbarians, Counterinsurgency and the Remaking of Afghanistan. Uh, it focuses on the emergence and evolution of the Afghan local police, uh, a poor government militia supported by NATO and US military, among other places in Wardak province. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that the LP was not the first such experiment in militia formations. <coughs> Going back to uh, early years of intervention, uh, uh, the U.S. military intervention, you know, the Northern Alliance commanders and warlords were used as foot soldiers, so the original sin really dates back to 2001, but they were also around 2005 and 2006 when the insurgency uh, spread from the south to the center uh, and the north, uh, the U.S. military started arming local militias, uh, and there were a number of them, the National uh, Auxiliary Police, the Afghan Public Protection Program, and the Local Defense Initiative. Uh, which was just before the ALP. Uh, 
Uh, so the advent of the ALP uh, in response to the spread of the insurgency, uh, before the advent of the ALP, local militias under US military control had taken an ad hoc and very decentralized character, uh, which is, I think, an, an interesting point because the, the way the Americans are going about arming militias, uh, in a way, I argue, forced the government and President Karzai to try and centralize the means of coercion and patronage that was uh, in a, um, around that. Uh, so it became a key priority for the Afghan government. In 2009, uh, after winning a second term, President Karzai made it very clear in his inaugural speech uh, that within three to five years, he would build the Afghan uh, regular forces, army, and police. But at the same time, he, he said that within two years, he will adopt more stringent measures to improve the regulation of local militias, and especially the operations of private security companies, uh, which he, uh, um, you know, he had a big problem with that. To achieve his first objective, that's improving capabilities of ANCF, he did a couple of things. First, he pushed for a greater combat role for the Afghan army and police because he was uh, arguing that as long as the Americans were fighting and were taking lead in combat, they will never invest enough in the police and the army. So that was his uh, argument for, uh, for also pushing the date of transfer of security responsibilities from 2013 to 2014, basically to give uh, the army and the police at least a year in which they were taking a lead in combat and they were also getting used to their, to their role. Uh, and that way, uh, he knew that as long as the Americans were not fighting and the Afghan forces were fighting, uh, then they would be forced to invest in them and in training and equipping the Afghan national security forces. Uh, to achieve his second objective, that's improve the regulation of local militias, uh, he embarked on a, what I call a twin initiative. One was the establishment of the Afghan local police, and the other one was the uh, uh, establishment of the Afghan Public Protection Force, which is a government and Ministry of Interior uh, force that replaced private security companies. Uh, and that's how, basically, his former Minister of Interior uh, justified, um, uh, basically, the arming of local militias, although the president was initially quite critical of it. But right from the beginning, he faced a lot of resistance from donors and, uh, and uh, Western militaries, because a lot of them dependent on these private militias and local securities, uh, you know, among other things for uh, protecting logistic convoys and also securing military bases. So when it was approved by the Afghan government in 2010, the Afghan local police uh, basically incorporated all previous militia formations. Uh, on the one hand, gave it legitimacy. On the other hand, allowed the US military to expand the program. Uh, so the ALP, I argue, uh, represented the struggle between President Karzai and the US military over the control of local armed groups. Uh, it was an imperfect solution that allowed Karzai to centralize his hold over the murky world of US counterinsurgency, uh, represented by the fragmentation and decentralization of violence involving a variety of armed groups and the patronage that was, of course, uh, associated with that. So it was basically a fight over the control of armed groups and patronage. By the end of uh, the decade, the US military were also presenting uh, the efforts to arm local militias very much in the language of tradition and respect for Afghan culture and for Afghan values. Uh, because NATO somehow hoped that you know, the still tribal Afghans could be once again armed uh, and used against the uh, Taliban. Uh, and it's also interesting to point out that NATO's efforts in this direction were presented as a corrective to Western interference and imposition of liberal norms and institutions on non-Western and non-liberal societies. Jonathan talked about that. Uh, but it was also somewhat a vague and nonetheless revealing critique of earlier Western attempts at nation building. So experts overall agreed that uh, in their diagnosis that Western failures to build a centralized nation state uh, and hence double their efforts in engaging and cultivating the traditional and the customary field. Uh, this discursive shift uh, from earlier sort of nation building rhetoric <coughs> uh, involved the invocation of colonial imageries in reference to Afghanistan's own authentic tradition and uh, institutions. 
But these were, however, primarily framed through a military lens and the pursuit of a military goal, basically to justify and indeed legitimate the continuation of NATO's uh, policies exemplified by the war on terror. I show in the study of the Alpine Wardag that there remained a significant gap between Western claims made about authenticity and non-interference and the actual processes through which local forms of security were promoted. Uh, the so-called local solutions were in fact imposed from above. This is an example of how some Americans fetishized culture. The ALP was initially envisaged as a short-term solution. Arg initially, the argument was for two or three years until the, the more regular forces were built up, and then they would be either disbanded or integrated into the uh, National Army and police. Uh, the ALP story is also illustrative of a broader dynamic of how everything is short-term based on expediency and pressure to float immediate solutions and then deliver them in the envelope bearing the seal of culture and tradition. In short, I argue, it's imperialism on the cheap. However, the US military's attempt to resuscitate age-old traditions of self-protection, notions that were based on an idealized and reified vision of the past, proved problematic, and for that matter, the willingness of Afghans to stand up to the Taliban. Government-backed militias were very unpopular. Uh, and especially in a place like Wardag, which has a history of factional fightings. So basically, it, as a strategic resource, uh, you know, it became, it, in, it, it, in a way, it, uh, uh, the conflicts were, uh, it exacerbated conflicts. Uh, a sense of insecurity also prevented ordinary people and villages uh, from involvement in the program. Uh, most villagers felt very insecure and would not and could not associate themselves with a program that was basically funded by the U.S. military. Uh, so as a consequence, the U.S. military struggled in Wardak. There was also, because of the transformation in the countryside and the loss of influence by so-called traditional leaders uh, who played in the past a uh, intermediary role, a brokering role, uh, it was very difficult for the Americans to find authentic tribal leaders. Uh, so as a result, the main beneficiaries of the program were commanders, local commanders, and power brokers who reinvented themselves and their militias and expanded their power. As a result, the local intermediaries earned a premium, premium as a function of their brokering role and those seen as tribal were trying to break out and wanted a modern state. Uh, the U.S. Special Forces also used local <coughs> militias mostly for counterterrorism purposes and nitrate. So in that sense, they played a very little role in protecting civilians, which was its original aim. Since the ALP played a negligible role in improving security, in the spring and summer of 2012, Senior Afghan officials and U.S. Special Forces were now discussing a more dramatic, if problematic, solution. And that was arming Hizb Islami, which was a local jihadi group that had been in conflict with the Taliban for many years. So with the failure of ALP in Wardag, the U.S. military in many ways abandoned counterinsurgency and all the language around protection and, uh, and all that, and went back to counterterrorism tactics and the use of proxy militias. However, the human cost and the political cost of this uh, shift was so great that the subsequent stages of U.S. military presence in Wardag severely strained relations between the Afghan and the U.S. government. And in the spring of 2002, also, there were changes in the U.S. military structure. Uh, as part of Obama's plan to withdraw forces, regular forces were taken out and special forces came in. And that was sort of the background to the war crimes that were reported in early 2013. Uh, although the president appointed three commissions, there was very little clarity as to what happened. And you know, well, everybody knew what happened, but who was responsible for these crimes? The Americans denied it, and Karzai kept on saying, 
uh, you know, it was ISAF and U.S. Special Forces. So this has remained as such, and I argue that one of the reasons why, you know, there was no resolution to the issue was because somehow this was useful. The, the, the more ambiguous it remained, it allowed U.S. Special Forces, and some were even arguing CIA, to basically uh, avoid responsibility for what had happened. In conclusion, I argue that Warda constitutes a microcosm of the dynamic of conflict in Afghanistan as a whole. Western politicians invoke the image of Afghanistan as an ungoverned space, a zone of chaos, and a front line of the war on terror. Warda in this discourse is positioned as a front line of the war against Taliban barbarians. In this seemingly mythical confrontation, civilizations and barbarians sustain each other. The Taliban thrive on the presence of foreign infidels, a reference to NATO and US special forces as US forces, while at the same time, Taliban continu Taliban's continued armed resistance against US and NATO forces provide the justification for continued US military presence. I'll just digress a little bit. This morning, the palace put out a statement uh, in response to an earlier Taliban statement welcoming Karzai's position on the bilateral security agreement. He's refusing not to sign it. And it was an interesting statement because Karzai basically said, you know, they may be welcoming my stand, but <laughs> you have to look at sort of the broader dynamic, which is, and this basically uh, was what I was saying earlier, that the Taliban basically thrive on the U.S. military presence and the, the U.S. justify their continued presence in Afghanistan because they see the threat of Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And I think it's a very telling statement. Uh, but also, uh, on, on the other side, the whole discussion around uh, the bilateral security agreement, and some of you who follow news on Afghanistan, there was a consultative jirga end of November, the third week of November. And one of the interesting things that came out of that uh, jirga was how those who benefited from the U.S. presence and the NATO presence were actually the strongest advocates of a position asking Karzai to sign this deal. And it's emblematic of the broader, uh, of the broader problem because um, Jonathan referred to this. What happens when all this dries out? And the implication of that, uh, I mean, especially if it deals with this, I won't go into that. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. Afghanistan has been mired in civil war for 35 years. And for at least two decades of that time, it's been overlaid with foreign intervention. We had nine years of intervention by the Soviet Union, and we've had 12 years and still continuing intervention by the, Soviet, by the United States and NATO. And it'll be exactly a quarter of a century next February that the last Soviet soldier left. And I and many other journalists rushed to Kabul to see what would happen. It sometimes seems like yesterday, um, because when one sees what's going on now, the comparisons and similarities are so acute with that period in 1989. And what I've done in this paper is to sort of compare and contrast the two retreats, the Soviet retreat in 1989, 1988, ending in 1989, and NATO's current retreat. And then to ask two key questions. How significantly does this NATO retreat differ from the Soviet one? And more importantly, perhaps, can Afghans expect a brighter future now than the turmoil and tragedy they suffered after the last withdrawal in 1989. Now, let me first deal with the similarities. And of course, one can find similarities in the origins of these two interventions as well. They were both done by outside powers, superpowers. They were both designed to 
topple the regime and start nation building to support the modernizers against the conservatives. And of course, they soon found that they were fighting an ever increasing insurgency, which made it both more difficult to withdraw and yet in a sense, ultimately more essential that they did withdraw. It took the Russians almost a decade to, to reach that point. Although the political awareness that the war was unwinnable came within two or three years of the original intervention, which was easy and quick. They toppled the regime very quickly in Kabul, just as the Taliban were toppled very quickly in 2001. But by the mid-1980s, there were three things happening, which I think are very similar to what's happening now. One, there was war weariness on the Soviet side. Because of the lack of success, the amount of lives and money that had been spent in Afghanistan, and the failure to see any real perspective of things changing over time. And of course, that's the same mood among Western public opinion and the electorates in the United States, particularly, and in this country. People are just fed up, and they see little future in continuing this war, and they're glad that it seems to be coming to an end. The similar thing, too, was the frustration of the leadership. The Soviet leadership was frustrated with their Afghan, quotes, allies, as just as much as the Americans and NATO are frustrated with Karzai and their Afghan allies today. The reasons for the frustration differed. In the Soviet case, it was incredible infighting. Although it was a one-party state, Afghanistan under Soviet occupation, there were two wings of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, PDPA, the ruling party, that were loggerheads most of the time in terms of ideology, in terms of tribal and ethnic issues, and uh, often came to blows. Just whereas the Western governments are more frustrated with the sort of corruption that they see at all levels of the Afghan administrative system and the lack of good governance. And third thing that's so similar is this hope that somehow the center will hold, that, uh, that the Afghan forces that have been trained by the uh, occupiers will somehow be able to keep the insurgency at bay. It's a hope at best, it's a sort of prayer at worst. Now, there was one other important similarity in terms of the context of the two interventions, and that was that halfway through, a new leadership emerged. In the Kremlin, of course, Mikhail Gorbachev came in and quickly saw that the war really was going nowhere. In the United States, Obama came in, a war that he'd inherited from George W. Bush, but he didn't see as clearly as Gorbachev had seen that the war was unwinnable. In fact, he insisted that whereas the Iraq war, which he'd opposed, was a war of choice, he said, quite rightly, I mean, it's quite correct def definition, Afghanistan, he claimed, was a war of necessity. Gorbachev never trapped himself in such language, which, of course, makes it hard to go into a U-turn. And the military, the Soviet military, were also convinced after the first two or three years that they could not win. So it was a matter of retreating in an orderly way with dignity and without having to admit publicly at least defeat. One big difference was there was no surge. Gorbachev didn't come in and say, well, we'll have a last big push and perhaps my predecessors were wrong and we can have another go. Obama, as you know, tripled the number of American forces that were in Afghanistan from the number that he inherited from Bush. But now, of course, the, the NATO is retreating and pulling out. They're not doing it as quickly as the Russians. The Russians withdrew in nine months in an orderly fashion from April 1988 when a treaty was agreed in Geneva which gave the date for their withdrawal until February the 15th, 1989. NATO's retreat is much slower. And of course, the other big difference is it's not necessarily going to be complete. When the Russians pulled out, they pulled out lock, stock, and barrel. 
and only a very few number of troops, perhaps in the hundreds maximum, remained to guard the Soviet embassy. And there were some special forces in the northern part of Afghanistan, which at that time bordered on what was then the Soviet Union before Tajikistan and Uzbekistan became independent. Um, they did have some special forces, but they weren't significant. It's nothing like what NATO is planning to keep, uh, perhaps 15,000 troops, if this agreement is eventually signed. Um, now, that's not just a technical difference. It's crucially important politically, because when Najibullah, who was the Afghan leader in 1989, <coughs> found there were no Soviet troops, he wasn't happy that it was happening, but he managed to make a virtue out of necessity by saying, I am now leader of an independent, sovereign country. We do not have foreign troops here. We are masters of our own destiny. And it, it wasn't just a propaganda ploy. There was some genuine feeling among Afghans that they were now uh, proud to be sort of on their own. And uh, if you talk to Afghans of a certain age in Kabul today, many of them will say the Najibullah period was the best one they can remember in their lives because they didn't have foreign troops in the country. They didn't have the indignity of seeing these Humvees going down the road in Kabul all the time, reminding them that they're under a Soviet, uh, under a, a foreign occupation. Uh, and they felt they were running their own country. Um, and um, life actually in, for three years in Kabul was much more secure than it is in Kabul today. Because the insurgents were basically held at bay by the Afghan forces without the need of foreign troops. When Najibullah did eventually collapse three years later, it wasn't primarily because the Mujahideen, as the insurgents were called in those days, moved forward through military superiority and captured Kabul. It was because the Russians, who were now under Yeltsin, not under Gorbachev, and had very different priorities, decided to cut aid to Afghanistan cut the money, cut the fuel that was you know, vital for, this, uh, for the Afghan army to keep its equipment going, and uh, cut the weapons supplies as well. So I suppose if it comes on now to the lessons for today, one lesson is that if you want to keep a regime going, you do have to maintain aid, even if you don't have any troops there. Uh, and I think many people in Kabul now are just hoping that Western aid will not re dramatically reduce. Of course, publicly, the West says we're going to continue applying $4 billion a year for the next 10 years. That's what's been agreed, but there's still the fear that, that it, when it comes down to it, um, local, uh, the, the, the governments of the NATO countries will gradually erode the amount of money they're giving. The second thing is that, um, lesson for today, is that ultimately there has to be a political settlement. Gorbachev did try and do that, and he was urging Najibullah to conduct what they called, exactly as they call it today, political reconciliation. But it was much um, more genuine, I think, in the Najibullah period. There was a real opening to the insurgent forces to try and find some kind of compromise leadership to produce a government of national unity that would end this <coughs> civil war, which I mentioned is the key thing when I started the, this talk. Um, the NATO definition of reconciliation is hardly ever spelt out, but when it is spelt out, it means surrender. Um, so it's not really reconciliation. <laughs> it's that you have to reconcile with me by dropping your guns, accepting my constitution, and taking part in the political process that I have set in motion. Uh, that is not reconciliation. That is surrender. And the WikiLeaks um, uh, things that came out three years ago, if you remember, um, revealed all that because they, in the diplomatic cables at the State Department, we, we found out what Richard Holbrook, who was then the, you know, the special envoy of the president, was saying to people in private meetings um, when he, he said basically uh, used the phrase surrender he said remember what happened at the end of our civil war in the United States General Lee surrendered mm. and we you know Mullah Omar the only way we'll see him again is if he surrenders um, so the, th the third point is that if there are peace talks and reconciliation they're actually going to be very difficult the lesson 
from 1989 and the 1990s is that peace talks among Afghans are always notoriously difficult. And uh, in fact, they led to civil war throughout the 1990s. The, the Mujahideen, having captured Kabul, then broke down into civil war, and it was out of that that the Taliban emerged as the strongest faction in, 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 in this civil war. So I think, the, 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 to, to come to a to an, to conclusion, the, the situation is quite gloomy for Afghanistan now because I think, first of all, there are no peace talks. The fighting is going to continue. They are obstructed by outside powers. Pakistan is as relevant now as it was in 1992. Uh, it is arming the insurgency. It shows, shows no sign of really being willing to push for peace talks. Um, and... Uh, I think the Taliban will gradually erode the power of the uh, Afghan national forces in, in the whole of the south and the east where the Pashtun uh, uh, population is uh, predominantly uh, living. And um, the aid, I think, will be eroded to the center from foreign countries. So I think it's going to be a very messy situation. Don't forget that the casualty figures of the Afghan national army are colossal. They're losing something like... Uh, Forces are using something like 100 men a week, 75 police, 25 army. This is an attrition of 5,000 a year. That is, in one year, they're losing more people than the whole foreign occupiers have lost in the 10 years they've been there. 9,000 9, Afghans are becoming IDPs, internally displaced, losing their homes every month because of the, they have to flee from the villages where the fighting is intensifying or the Taliban are taking over. Uh, collaborators, people who are seen as collaborators, are being assassinated at an incredible rate, roughly 12 a week. Um, so there is an incredible erosion of the of the Afghan administrative system as the Taliban move in. Will they capture Kabul? Finally, I'll end on that note. They they didn't capture uh, the insurgents didn't capture Kabul for three years after 1989. I don't think the Taliban will capture Kabul for three years after 2014. But I think they will take hold of a large part of the south and the east and eventually, uh, essentially, the civil war will carry on. Thank you for that uh, gloomy but nevertheless realistic <laughs> note. I just realised that Cyrus has armed, with, not armed me with a stick. I don't know <laughs> whether that's because this is an Afghan event or because of what's been going on uh, outside, but I'm going to brandish it as you ask your questions to make sure that there is short and concise and to the point as possible. <laughs> so, yes, gentlemen. Uh, since this is the fourth time Britain's waged a war against Afghanistan, and uh, the first speaker was talking about the reduction in income of the Afghan state, do you think Britain should pay war repar reparations to Afghanistan? I didn't pay it the first time, the second time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you should see it in those terms. Sorry, uh, this is not a war, Britain versus Afghanistan. There is a huge constituency and the lower Jirga, because consultative lower Jirga showed very clearly, Mujahedi was on the verge of tears asking Karzai, please sign. sign. It's not, it, it's very complicated. There are a lot of emotions involved, there are a lot of states involved. And, and Karzai is not just doing it because he's mad, he also has genuine concerns. As a president, you don't want to go down in history as someone who basically couldn't stop the Americans, uh, you know, bombarding and carrying nitrates and assassinations, uh, uh, because he believes, and uh, and this was sort of gist of the statement that he put out this morning, which was, you know, if you if the, as long as I can't stop the Americans from killing Afghans, that sustains the Taliban, that empowers the Taliban, and I've got to do something about that. And I think, I mean, you can see it as uh, you know he's been on meds and all that, but. It's uh, it's not really that simple, and he's genuinely, he really genuinely believes that this war must, you know, must come to an end. And he also has a stake in trying to sort of make sure that he centralizes uh, his hold over whatever is there, so that you know the scenario that Jonathan Steele presented to us doesn't happen. Any other questions? Here? I have. Uh, firstly, thank you for your talks. Um, I think it's been hinted at a little bit in your in your speech at the, at the beginning, but what do you think about the Pakhtun identity polemics internally? Because this is also a subject that doesn't get enough reference that 
So you talked about, uh, earlier you mentioned this hybrid uh, system of governance brought out. You mentioned the Jit Guard and the kind of deals being broken, but there's also something internally within this community, if you don't mind me saying this community or something. But what about the identity politics there? Because that's also feeding into this uh, Taliban movement, and feeding into a resentment. There's uh, an interesting struggle, if you like, going on there, which has been for some time, but I think now it's resurfacing. We'll take each several questions. Yep. Um, do you think that the presidential elections are going to matter? Uh, is there any hope of the, someone being elected out of that who would have enough of a mandate to either reform um, some of the corruption in the state or to be able to undertake negotiations? And one more. Yeah. Uh, about the ANSF, the Afghan National Security Forces, and maybe with particular reference to this British-supported uh, officer training academy. So the officers have uh, finally their own academy, and the British Army has committed to training these officers for the next three or four years, at least. And we have also seen evidence of the increasing capabilities of the, uh, of the Afghan National Security Forces. It is undeniable that the training in the past is very poor, but in the last three or four years, there have been increasingly good reports that actually they're getting better quality training and are improving. So what is the, what is the likelihood and how might it happen that perhaps we could have a lull and uh, maybe be able to sustain the situation and then the Afghan uh, army with a diverse officer class could actually start to expand from the center to the other parts of the country in terms of establishing uh, governance. The responses to those questions, and I'll get another round. Come on, that's one more. Thanks, Ryan. Oh. Um, well, I've run out some of these as easy you should respond to. I mean, I, I just to connect two questions on, on Pashtun identity and uh, presidential candidates. I mean, that and will a legitimate um, and consensus candidate emerge? I think um, it's received wisdom that there will have to be a Pashtun. Um, it would be unprecedented for a non to become president. I mean, and uh, Abdullah, the, the, concept, the, 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 the common analysis is that Abdullah would have to win in the first round if he were to become president. If he went to a second round, then the Pashtuns would basically, um, there would be a, some kind of arrangement to ensure a Pashtun candidate would win. Um, I think. Uh, the issue around, uh, I guess, the, um, the, the the elections is not about is less about um, it's not going to be free and fair. It's not going to follow democratic practices and norms. Um, it's whether um, a sufficiently inclusive political coalition will emerge. And uh, you know, it, Karzai seems to be playing a very smart game here um, and delaying. He's, he's retaining all the cards. So yeah, there's a question there. The question then is, will it's, it's not about whether it's going to be a democratic um, and open and fair process, but whether it's going to be one that will produce a stable, sufficiently stable and inclusive candidate. Um, I'll leave it at that. On the question dynamics, <laughs> when you had this notion that the Pashtuns were marginalised in the beginning, the Northern Alliance and the Tajiks were in charge. Then, a couple of years later, there was concern around Pashtuns are taking over, others are being marginalized, and you know, I think uh, at some point uh, Sharon refers to this dynamic. Uh, and I think it's very complicated because you can't see these blocks as monolithic. Right? There's a lot of alliances and divisions within the Pashtuns. There are a lot of divisions within sort of opposition, if you like, the Northern Alliance and the minorities. I mean, look at, and this also brings it back to the to the election uh, issue, how Karzai basically, he did it. I mean, masterfully divided the entire opposition. He took Masood, uh, Ahmed Shah Masood's brother and allied him. One of the, you know, his candidates uh, 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 brought Dostum to stand next to Rani, basically completely demolished the opposition against uh, you know so called Karzai and his candidate. So he's playing a very interesting game. I mean I, my fear is that because there are so many candidates, 
and there is not sort of a strong uh, personality, everybody's going to land up with 20%, 25%, and nobody's going to sort of go to the 50 plus mark, and then you will have probably a second round. And then we'll see the dynamics. Uh, it seems to me that you know he's just waiting and playing around and see how many people he can divide them and then probably throw his support behind somebody. So uh, in terms of, <coughs> yeah, so I mean, what to me is interesting is, and a lot of, there's a lot of sort of negative uh, rhetoric around how Karzai is building or is ruling or the way he's uh, basically uh, governing the country, you know, patronage based and, and all that, I see that not <coughs> as a weakness, I see it as a strength. And don't forget the international, the flow of international aid has, has really, really positioned him in a very, very strong, uh, put him in a very strong position because then he can sort of wheel and deal with a lot of constituencies, buy some, uh, you know, in the parliament around the election of 2011, he did that very well, you know, uh, imposed his, uh, his conditions and, and brought in some of his supporters. Uh, so the concern then, of course, is what happens when sort of the international aid dries up because that will leave him in a weaker position. Not just him, but any other president who comes in. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. And somebody wanted to answer the trailer. Well, should I deal with that? Sure. I mean, um, you know, all the official metrics are that the Afghan National Security Forces are getting better and they're better trained and so on, they've got better equipment, but it's the results on the ground that count. And I've already mentioned these statistics, incredibly high casualty totals, people being killed and wounded. So I don't, uh, I mean, that's ultimately what it's all about. And clearly we know they don't have uh, the same air cover that the Western forces have. They don't have the medevac facilities, so they get much higher number of people die who are wounded, whereas, you know, the British and American forces have very efficient helicopter medivac and very best kind of field um, surgery available, etc., etc. So, and there's massive desertion. I mean, the, 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 roughly a third of the ANSF has to be recycled every year because um, people don't re-enlist or they desert or they get killed and wounded. So uh, I think, um, although the, the, the the public uh, justification for the withdrawal is uh, from David Cameron and Barack Obama is that you know these forces are now in a position to take the lead and they are taking the lead and we can step back, etc. I, I think the results on the ground uh, don't really bear that out. Um, on the on the elections, I mean, I think everything really has to be focused on on this issue of will the war continue? Will it get worse? Will it get less? And will there be peace talks? And I, the one good thing about Karzai going is, is that the uh, Taliban have always considered him to be a complete puppet with whom they will never negotiate. They've always said we will only negotiate with the occupiers, with the United States and so on. Well, as the US presence reduces, that argument um, may slightly erode on the Taliban side and uh, it makes it easier for them to negotiate with somebody who's not Karzai. So, so in that sense, there's a slight glimmer of light at the end of the peace talks tunnel if Karzai is no longer in charge and if the US plays a less dominant role. But I think it's, you still have to square the circle of will the Taliban give up their argument that there's no negotiation possible as long as foreign troops are in the country. And that's why um, the fact that there will be probably this bilateral security agreement will eventually be signed by somebody and the U.S. is obviously determined to remain, um, if it can, um, means that the peace talks, again, from that point of view, also will be quite uh, dubious whether they can really get anywhere or even start. Okay, there are some more questions. First one yeah, yeah. Back. Uh, We all know that uh, Iran has this huge involvement and inter interference in Iraq, especially after the withdrawal of American forces from Iraq. And this obviously, you know, because Iraq has a huge com and major majority of Iraqis are Shias, and especially the exile opposition before Azar Saddam were Shias, so that's why uh, it can play its role, huge role. But w what do you think after the withdrawal of uh, the foreign uh, forces from Afghanistan, I mean, uh, 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 the Iranian interference in Afghanistan going to be? 
and in which way? Okay, over this first two legs, yep. Um, do you think humanitarian aid is delegitimized by its connection to the military, um, whether it's perceived to be connected or is actually connected? And do you think that with the military withdrawal, that would change? Which panel? Where was final one? Yeah, I, w I just want to ask about the role of the other Central Asian countries, for example, some powerful Central Asian countries, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, in this process, in keeping the NATO forces in Afghanistan in order to maintain the peace and economic development. Because even, for example, in case of Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan has already 137 kilometers border with Afghanistan, but Afghanistan has a long 1,000 kilometer border with Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. So drug dealers can bring the drugs to the Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, to the Kazakhstan, uh, sorry, to the Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, to the Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. So how do you see the role of these Central Asian countries? Are they now pushing the NATO powers to keep their forces inside Afghanistan, and what are they doing? So it's three questions on aid and international relations. Who'd like to start? Well, should I just kick off on, I'll just deal with Iran and Central Asia. Yes, I mean, Iran has complicated uh, interests in Afghanistan. Um, on the one hand, they don't want the, the Americans to be there and have bases there because they see themselves, well, they, it's not the same now but as when the Iraq war was on, but when the Iraq war was on, they felt they were surrounded. They have the American bases in Iraq, American bases in Afghanistan and could potentially be used for some kind of invasion. Um, so they were, of course, delighted when the Americans pulled out of Iraq and they were very influential in persuading Maliki to get rid of the Americans and not to sign the same kind of bilateral security arrangement that the Americans are trying to get and with no Gaza. Iraq, but on the other hand, um, you know, they're not very happy with a, with a sort of um, Sunni-dominated Taliban regime taking over in Kabul. Though there are some contradictions. I mean, I interviewed Gulbuddin Hekmatia, the head of Hezbi Islami, one of the most ferocious Pashto nationalists in Afghanistan, in 2002. Where was he? In Tehran, um, in a safe house provided by the Iranian government. Um, and they, he then later went and moved back to uh, southern Afghanistan when the insurgency got going again against the Americans. So, you know, there can be extraordinary marriages of convenience between if, if the mullahs in in Tehran can make a deal with uh, with uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar in 2002, maybe they can make a deal with him in 2017 or 16 or 15. Um, and certainly they are, there is evidence that they are sending arms supplies to the Taliban uh, at the moment. From Central Asia? Oh, Central Asia, yes. I think the countries are very um, concerned. Um, and not only Central Asia, but Russia. I mean, it's one of the sort of great ironies of this whole thing, you know, even forget, if, it, if you look at the, the Russian position in history in Afghanistan, the Russians actually want the Americans to stay in Afghanistan. Um, uh, in fact, I interviewed the uh, Russian ambassador uh, in, uh, about a year ago in, in, in Kabul, and he was saying, you know, he was just uh, driving a coach and horses through this argument that, uh, you know, the army is getting better, transition is, is, is working, and therefore we can withdraw. He said the security situation is getting worse all the time, so how can they withdraw? They should recognize the fact that they have to stay here because security is going to go down the drain when they, when they leave. So the Russians are actually more keen to stay now, and it's not just for some kind of schadenfreude thing. They want to sort of see the Americans getting defeated um, or bloody noses all the time. Um, it is a genuine fear that uh, if, if a Taliban regime takes over in Kabul, with, with a sort of, a sort of, it will give a great push to Islamic fundamentalists throughout the region, in Central Asia, and of course in southern uh, Russia, in the Caucasus area, Dagestan, Chechnya, <coughs> and the rest of it. So uh, I, I think uh, the Central Asian countries are quite concerned about the American withdrawal, and the Russians are too. Can I just add on the, the Central Asia? I mean, I think Afghanistan. <clears throat> and the intervention had a profound effect on the uh, political processes within the Central Asian states. I mean, it's um, the central. It's it reinforced this, the trend that we see, particularly in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, towards authoritarianism. It's giving a, a lot of rent-seeking opportunities for 
for the political leaders there because of concerns about the, the spreading insecurity of drugs and terrorism. Um, and with the withdrawal, it probably will heighten those those dynamics, I think. I mean, I was in Tajikistan six weeks ago, and you know, the talk was that, that Tajikistan's, you know, this bulwark against the you know, radicalization of these kind of, you know, in, you know the, the, these insecurities emanating from Afghanistan. So I think it, it's had quite an important political impact on the region more broadly. I just want to have a quick, um, quick thing about humanitarian aid. I mean, uh, I don't know if you, you was it six or seven acted staff were killed last week in Afghanistan. Um, it's you know, it's, a, it's a very dangerous place to be an aid worker, um, and most of the people killed are actually Afghans, not internationals. Or a lot of internationals have been killed. Um, and I, I in the 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 special issue, I do um, an article on NGOs and civil military relations, and clearly the, the Taliban are very aware of how international aid organisations. Many of them have aligned themselves with the the, the, the project in, a, in, in in Afghanistan, and uh, you know, this is they're being funded by occupying powers, and the Taliban see this and make that connection. So clearly, um, there is a, um, uh, there, uh, there, there has been a, a problem for NGOs working in Afghanistan, and uh, how do you remain autonomous, independent, and so? You know, Neutral and impartial in this kind of environment. Um, in the, tr I mean, the one kind of ray of hope, I suppose, in, with the transition is that there's going to be a sorting process in the years to come. That a lot of the the organisations who are attracted to Afghanistan by the the opportunities and the resources, um, they will disappear, and some of the kind of long term NGOs who are serious and have been working there for many years know the context well enough quick plug for Afghan aid because I'm a trustee of Afghan aid. Organizations like Afghan aid um, and you know, many others who have been working there for many years, and, <coughs> you know, I think they, they have had to negotiate with all sides and will continue doing that um, at risk to themselves, but they will continue to function. If I could uh, quickly jump on this humanitarian uh, aid question, uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, I recently was in Kabul and I was speaking to sort of the classic humanitarian humanitarians, the ICRC, and they are finding it very difficult operating in an environment where there's fragmentation of violence. There are, uh, and because of the US military tactics, night raids and taking out commanders, new commanders are coming uh, to the fore and they are much more radical. And because so many uh, of these leaders are changing all the time, even institutions like the ICRC, which has been there for donkey years, are finding it so difficult to renegotiate and, and, and build relations, and the, those relations are disrupted every time the command is taken out. So it's very difficult, and, and, and one of, you know, I think it was last year, the staff in, in Jalalabad were killed. Uh, the acted story in, in, in Balghis is a, another indication. But there's also, a, you know, you have to point out uh, that most of the stuff that the NGOs are doing are not humanitarian. And most of them are involved in development work. Most of them are involved in programs that, programs like the NSP and acted in, in fact is it, in fact is an implementing partner of the NSP, which is you know a highly political project in itself. So, and there was also this debate with NGOs, the so-called old NGOs and the ones who have been operating in Afghanistan for. A very long time could go back to this golden age of humanitarianism, and I, I don't think I don't believe that, and I think that age is lost. Or that age was never there. It's just the uh, imagination, uh, imagine people's minds. Uh, so I see that you know, if ISIS is finding it so difficult, I think a lot of other NGOs will also find it uh, very difficult in the years to come. Okay, then. <coughs> well, a little while earlier, I did hear, hear the tinkle of glasses and bottles and things. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if that wasn't just my imagination, then perhaps we should wrap it up now and say thank you to the speakers, and we can continue our uh, discussion over some refreshments. So thank you very much.